So Seda Grossos is here to talk about, uh, give us a critical overview of the past decade of privacy enhancing research. Um, please give her a warm round of applause of welcome. Thank you. And thank you for getting up and coming here. Uh, it was hard for me, so I'm assuming it was just as hard for you. Um, I will come from an academic perspective, which can actually induce sleep, in which case, please use the shoulder to your left or right, if whichever is available. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, what I'm going to do is talk about what, has, what I will call privacy research within computer science. I'm a computer scientist, specifically a requirements engineer. Um, a lot of my work is on privacy and security requirements um, engineering. Uh, anyway, so there's a lot of research that's been going on on privacy, and what I would like to do is open up a discussion and hope that it will be a robust discussion so we don't you know, try to protect what we do but have a critical take at it with the intention to improve it. Um, am I sometimes losing the voice? Because, yeah, I am, huh? All right, so, um, so what I'll try to do is look at a number of privacy technologies or solutions and see where their successes are and where their failures are. I'll try to go through them with you. In order to do that, I will look at some of the assumptions, some of the implicit and explicit assumptions, what the researchers aspire to do, some of the limitations of the technologies, and I will also count some future steps. I will talk about research, but some of the solutions and technologies I talk about you might have been involved in, activists have been involved in, um, TOR is an example. I'm not trying to in any way exclude people who have been participating. I'm just taking the research perspective and I'm relying on the researcher's perspective. Okay, but before I go on, I have to make a few distinctions in terms of vocabulary. So I first make a distinction between privacy and data protection. This distinction I'm taking from Serge Gutwert, who is also from Belgium, and basically um, Gutwert and Dehert in their paper say privacy is actually a rather vague notion, and this vagueness is part of its protective attributes. So because it's vague, because we don't know exactly what is privacy and what counts as a privacy breach, it's kind of like a flag you can put up if you have some problems which you would like to attribute to a privacy problem. Right, so the vagueness of the definition of privacy becomes part of its protectiveness. So you don't have a list of things that are privacy or privacy breaches. Instead, it's an open um, notion that you can pick up when you need it. Kind of like freedom in that sense. So it's non-absolute. It's very much dependent on the context what privacy means. It's relational. depends on what other elements are there legally and socially and technically and economically. And most important of all, it's about the opacity of the individual. So you want to somehow give the individual a sort of protection, um, a sort of opacity. Data protection, on the other hand, is a set of procedural safeguards. It's about making people who collect, or mostly organizations who collect data, accountable for their data practices. And in order to do that, it requires them to be transparent about the data practices that they uh, employ. So in that sense, data protection is a transparency tool. And I hope that now I've made clear that these are very, two, very different notions. Data protection may not always be about protecting your privacy. It's also important to um, note that when I talk about data protection, I'm talking about the EU directive. And there are two main objectives of the EU directive. One is to protect data. The other one is to make sure that it flows. So it's not about keeping the data protected. It's about making sure that within as, within countries who comply with data protection, information can flow freely. It's economic incentive as well. An important element of data protection is that it focuses on what is called personal data. And personal data is anything that can be somehow linked to an individual. So in both cases, the focus is on the individual. And here I would like to move on to yet another concept, which I will call surveillance. I'm sure you've heard of the panopticon. So the idea is that you have a tower in the middle, um, it was a, spoken about by Foucault, uh, it's an architectural concept for prisons, so you have a tower in which the guard um, observes the prisoners, um, and the idea is that the prisoners cannot see if they're being observed, and that way they have this concept, they have this feeling or perception that they're being observed all the time and start controlling themselves. Um, I'm going to talk about a very specific definition of surveillance, which is you collect information about a population, you collate and analyze that information that you collect, 
you do a statistical analysis, and then you decide who you're going to discriminate in that population. So you look for those who fit your norms or who fit the general norms, you look for those who do not, and you decide how you're going to treat them. A simple way to call this is also called social sorting. This theory I'm picking from a bunch of researchers called surveillance studies researchers. They're actually in a, sense, in a sort of parallel universe, um, universe to privacy researchers, and I highly recommend reading their material. Um, so what is important about the surveillance definition I'm using is that this kind of surveillance goes hand in hand with the modern state. So I'm not making a moral judgment value about the surveillance systems. I'm just saying, if you want to have a modern state which has you know, the citizens and offers some services to the citizens, then you're going to have to start counting those citizens. That means you're going to count your beans. That means you're going to start surveilling. Okay, so it kind of goes hand in hand the systems in most, with most of the systems we live in. Now, this is not the only model of surveillance of the panopticon I gave because it's recognizable. There are others, like there's surveillance, I'm not going to describe these. There's data valence, there's covalence, and recently I heard in Germany somebody's been talking about sauna valence. Um, I think some Jarvis and post privacy is in the topic. Anyways, I'm just going to talk about surveillance, okay? Population data, statistical analysis, and social sorting. So what I've done within computer science is to look at all the research that is done with the title privacy. Um, I will not summarize every one of them, but what I did find out when I looked at these papers is that they rely on very different assumptions and have different objectives. And I wanted to distinguish these, so I decided that I found, I mean, these might change with time, um, three different privacy research paradigms. Now when I talk about a research paradigm, I'm talking about the implicit assumptions that researchers use to do their research. So you need to have a set of assumptions that you work with so that you can improve your research, right? And what are these? So the most um, dominant paradigm that I find in privacy is privacy is confidentiality. So the definition of privacy that the people who work on privacy is confidentiality take is the right to be al let alone, as defined by Warren and Brandeis in 1890. And the basic principles that the solutions proposed by these researchers try to achieve is to hide information. Because the idea is, if you can keep your data to yourself, if you can keep your information to yourself, you have your privacy. If you reveal it, you lost it, your privacy is gone. So if you have your data, you have your privacy. If you reveal it or if it's leaked, you don't have your privacy, it's lost. So basic idea is to either hide this information or data or hide identity, so make it unlinkable to yourself. And the second paradigm, um, I will call the privacy as control. This is the more popular one that you see economically. Um, also, it, businesses like this definition. Um, it depends on this other definition of privacy, which is the right of the individual to decide what information about himself should be communicated to others and under what circumstances. That's from Western 1970. Um, some of the principles that the researchers try to achieve in this kind of research is separation of identity. So I have a number of digital identities. You can also call them data bodies. Um, and you maybe want to separate your audiences and you want to have some sort of control over what happens with the data once you've revealed it. So this idea in the privacy is confidentiality, which is that as soon as you reveal data, the control is gone, is actually reversed. Instead, once you reveal, you're allowed to have some sort of control. And somehow you try to do that technically, but you also have to rely on the transparency tool I talked about earlier, data protection. So those two things go hand in hand. So if you don't believe in legal mechanisms, you're probably not going to go with this paradigm. The last paradigm, which is rather less known, is what I call privacy as practice. And it depends on the definition, on different definitions, but the one I select here is the freedom from unreasonable constraints on the, constru on the construction of one's own identity from AGRI 1999. Um, I would also put Hildebrand's um, arguments on here where she says, we're not born with a specific identity. It's constantly in development as soon as we come and start interacting with our environment and with other people. And privacy is being able to do that, exactly. So it's very much about the collective experience we have with our data, with privacy, with transparency. So a lot of the solutions in this um, paradigm are about giving users information and feedback about what happens with their data or the data of the people that they're kind of collated with in the population, right? So transparency tools. Okay. Um, the basic argument I'd like to make is that none of these paradigms are the right paradigm or the wrong paradigm, and they actually work together really well. Um, 
and they also have similar failures on some level. So we'll talk about that now. Let's start with privacy's confidentiality. Um, just very short hist history. Um, a lot of the people who think privacy is confidentiality, so if your data is confidential, you have your privacy. If it's not confidential, you lost your privacy. So that paradigm actually comes a lot from security engineering, which comes a lot from military um, people in the past. Okay. So starting with 69, the first discussions in the US about creating centralized databases about citizens, um, politicians walk over to computer scientists, computer scientists or, or mostly security engineers are informed about this privacy problem and they say, well, that reminds us of a confidentiality problem, so privacy is confidentiality. So there's really this moment of stepping saying privacy is this, so this translation work that's being done. Um, you know, 70s, I think it's much more about access control. How do you actually manage access control in systems? 80s, you see, start seeing really interesting developments. So you have Chalm's proposal for anonymous communications. Um, so the idea, a lot of you probably know, is about keeping the confidentiality of uh, the content of communication and who's communicating, who's communicating with whom, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so, and um, the Andreas Fitzmann, who we lost, unfortunately, this year, Brigitte Fitzmann and Michael Weidner, and a few other people were in that community back then, so a very small community. Mid-80s, Chaum makes proposals for blind signatures. He's starting to build, he's trying to kind of develop these fun tricks where you're getting things which are usually seen as contradictory, so anonymity and authenticity is what he's going for in blind signatures. Um, 90s, um, Trump develops a scheme for anonymous cash. They actually had a company and they tried to introduce e anonymous e-cash. Um, the project failed, maybe a little bit too early for its time. Um, Brands then develops a scheme for single show selective disclosure credentials. So you have a credential and you don't show all the information that you have on that credential, but just parts of it. And you prove that the stuff on, on that um, credential is true. Um, Kamenish and Lysianskaya have then developed what are called multiple show selective disclosure credentials. So once you have a credential with a set of information, um, you can show different parts of it multiple times. That's basically the intuition you should have. The main idea with all these developments is that you want to minimize the data revealed during authentication authorization. So you want something with authentication um, and you want to prove certain things and make sure that you don't show anything else other than what you're proving, and this I will describe shortly as zero knowledge proofs. Okay. So in the 2000s, a lot of researchers joined this community, um, a lot of different workshops and conferences started, um, and hundreds of people are now working on these topics, and I will talk a little bit about the results. So just a real short introduction to anonymizers. So the point of an anonymizer is that you have two sets of people um, who are communicating, let's call them the anonymity set, um, and any observer cannot distinguish who in one anonymity set is communicating with the other. You can have different properties. It could be that the people you're communicating with don't know who you are. In other cases, it's just a relationship that is being hidden. So the model that the anonymizers rely on um, is that there's an adversary who does not know who's communicating with whom, but is able to make probabilistic models which means that you need to start thinking about mathematically modeling how strong your anonymity scheme is. In order to do that, you use metrics, um, mathematical metrics. Um, these are usually entropy-based metrics. And then comes the most important question that comes up again and again in privacy solutions, which means you need to decide how strong anonymity should be in order to provide the right kind of privacy in the real world. There is no answer to this question. It's not just a research question, it's an application question. We also have no procedure for deciding the strength of anonymity. The most important thing you should remember from anonymizers is the fact that when you use an anonymizer, or when a user uses an anonymizer, the user's traces are delinked from that identity. So what you leave behind cannot be linked back to you. Another um, set of solutions have been provided not by security engineers, but data, data miners. Data miners had a much more economic, economic approach to privacy. So their question was, how can I use data without infringing upon the rights of individuals? And specifically what they meant with that is, how can I do analysis on data without uniquely identifying who is in that data set? Um, this is sometimes very important. You can imagine in a hospital, you want to have some sort of transparency, right? You want to know how many of the people who visited that hospital died, for example. <laughs> and you want to make that information public, but 
if you can then you start uniquely identifying the people in that public data set, maybe for the people who died, that's not so important, but the ones who are still continuing to live, it might be an issue. All right, so the researchers um, came up with the concept of K-anonymity. So the idea was originally when you wanted to anonymize, you would just erase the name and maybe the date of birth. Um, but it turned out that if you just use the year of birth, gender, and zip code, you could identify up to 87% of the people in an anonymous database. Um, and so what they pr suggested doing is called K-anonymity. So you suppress certain information so that K people at all times cannot be distinguished from either, each other. So if you look here, the first two have the same birth years and the first gender and the zip code has been suppressed so that they're the same. So that way you know one of the two people you might know, but you don't know, with, you only know with 50% chance which disease they have, even if you know all that information. Right, so this was the idea. You can imagine K needs to be bigger. The question is how big should K be? So we again have this threshold problem. There's no answer to that. Those are the solutions. Now let's get, go to the critical perspective. Anonymization has failed. <laughs> okay, so um, when Sweeney did the first, first study where she identified 87% or so of the database, um, she proposed K-anonymity, and then people showed ways to attack K-anonymity. They came up with T-closeness, and then they came with L-diversity, and they came up with a bunch of new schemes in which you could scramble the data in the database, still get some utility out of the data without identifying individuals. It turns out, intuitively and mathematically, this does not work. You cannot anonymize databases and give any guarantees over time. Um, this was intuitively shown um, and mathematically shown by Shmatikov and Narayanan, who said you can always find another database. It could even be an anonymized database. Um, but you can always get more and more information. Eventually, linking a lot of databases, you will be able, able to identify 70, 80, 90% of the database. So this idea that you can anonymize and you will not be identified is a myth. What is interesting is data protection relies on us being able to do anonymization. Because data protection says, if you anonymize a data set, you can do whatever you want with it. You don't have to comply with anything anymore. It's free. Anonymization says, the results say, you cannot anonymize. That means personal data now is any data. That means data protection applies to every data. That means data protection is null, nullified, right? So this is a big problem. I'm not trying to say data protection is over and dead, but it's a big problem for the policymakers right now because A, they're trying to get their heads around the mathematical problem, and B, they're trying to figure out how they're going to save personal data. Okay. Um, there are some re recent um, proposals on how to deal with this. Cynthia Dwork is the one who then also mathematically showed why anonymization will never work. Instead, she came up with some other th way of um, doing things, which is, you know, the, that idea with... Um, Anonymization was that you build a big database, you anonymize it, you give it to the world, and everybody's happy. AOL search queries, typical example. Differential privacy says you build a database, you look, you try to anonymize. I don't think you even have to anonymize it, but yeah, of course you have to anonymize it, anonymize it very simply. But you allow people to do queries on that. You limit the number of questions they can ask, and you make sure that once they hit a different, a specific threshold, again the threshold, we don't know how far. Once they hit a threshold, they cannot make queries anymore. And that allows them to protect against intersection attacks, etc. You don't need to know about this. Just the point is they're doing this interactive database. They don't release the database to the whole public. You can make queries to it, and they limit the queries so that certain breaches do not happen, mathematically defined breaches. Okay. So the problem with anonymization Regardless of if it works or not, it's still something people use, right? People will say, I have anonymized. I mean, if you go to privacy policies, we anonymize your data before we share it with the third parties, etc. It's very much about an economic logic. It's also used in universities, etc. I'm not trying to criticize it all the way, but if you anonymize data, you basically in, 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 enter the economic logic. What is also important to notice, remember the surveillance definition I gave, Surveillance is still intact when you anonymize. So you can still look at the whole population. You can start doing discrimination and social sorting. Notice privacy and data protection says very little, if anything, about this kind of privacy problem. Right? They don't see it as a privacy problem almost. It's something else. Um, because privacy and data protection are very much focused on the individual. Surveillance as a problem, if you want to see it as a problem, is focused on social sorting and communities and discrimination. 
So I talked about data protection being at an ease. We need further research on this topic. It's a bit of a dead end, and we need to see where it goes. Okay, let's come back to the anonymizers. So some of the assumptions that the researchers make with respect to anonymizers are as follows. There is no trust on the internet. If you put your data, it's gone. Um, and this one is very important. Users are individually responsible for minimizing the collection and dissemination of their data. If they know your data, they being whoever, then they know you. So there's this really direct connection between your data and yourself and your intentions, etc. Um, collection and processing of personal data, if used against you, will have a chilling effect. And technical solutions should be preferred instead of relying on legal, solution, on legal solutions. These are like typical assumptions. Not everybody will make all of these assumptions, but these are the set of assumptions people mostly play around with that argue for the use of anonymizers. No, hold on. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to show you a quick film, and then we'll go on with the critique, okay? In the 90s, privacy research started becoming popular among security engineers. Privacy was defined as the right to be let alone and could be guaranteed in systems through data concealment. Specifically, security engineers were focusing on what they called anonymization. Some researchers in Dresden, Germany, were specifically looking to anonymize cell phone infrastructures. Anonymization meant that a third party could not infer by observing the cell phone infrastructure who were making phone calls, at what time, and from which location. In order to do this, researchers suggested adding encryption, dummy traffic, and mixes to the usual cell phone infrastructures. Although these additions guaranteed significant anonymity, the researchers ran into an unexpected physical problem. Two identical cell phones from the same manufacturer, coming out of the same assembly line one after the other, had enough differences in their electromagnetic fields to be distinguishable. The electromagnetic fields could be used as signatures and utilized to trace the users. The researchers had not considered this environmental factor in their anonymity model. They were devastated. The Dresdner researchers started collaborating with other researchers doing similar research in Scandinavia. They started discussing how they could achieve absolute anonymity. The Scandinavian researchers said, Let's imagine an anonymous city. In this city, everybody should wear a box as soon as they leave their homes. These boxes should be as wide as the widest person on earth and as tall as the tallest person on earth. The boxes should be standardized so that they are indistinguishable. When the citizens walk, they should do so in the same manner and as slow as the slowest person on earth. This way, they cannot be profiled according to the way they walk. If possible, they should leave their homes at selected intervals so that they cannot be profiled through the times in which they enter and leave their homes. Even better, dummy traffic should be introduced to the city, meaning two or more boxes should come out of each door, one containing the citizen, the other containing robots. When departing, the boxes should move in opposite directions so that it is difficult to distinguish boxes through their entrances and exits. Further, between two locations, different paths should be taken every time so that the citizens cannot be profiled according to the paths they use frequently. In this anonymous city, the citizens have asked to give up some of their anonymity in order to be able to move in the city with their pets. As a result, we have added some anonymity boxes for pets. As they discussed further, and the inconveniences of the anonymous city became evident, the researchers concluded that maybe this is not the way we want to live. Okay, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of an extreme, right? Like, if you really want to have <laughs> anonymity, but I think it's a nice way of also introducing, it also, it's also a nice way of introducing how anonymity, anonymity sets work, right? Like, and, uh, and also how difficult the task is of building an anonymizer um, that actually gives certain guarantees. 
But let's go back to the assumptions. Um, I want to focus on one of the assumptions, which is that users are individually responsible for minimizing the collection and dissemination of their data. This is also the case where you know, a lot of us will make the, this logical argument, users don't care, they're too stupid, they can't use them, right, this whole thing. But actually, maybe there's another perspective on this. So if you look at some of the surveillance studies authors, they would say, we live in a networked world, so the idea that you have to isolate yourself from the network in order to protect your privacy is actually counterintuitive to the fact that we have to constantly show we're connected and networked. The systems that we use do not want to identify us, they want to know where we are in the network. So isolation is not really an option. The marketing um, people using Foucault's theories said, this idea that you can protect yourself, let's say, from marketing systems and advertisement, et cetera, by pulling yourself out individually from you know, the, the marketing databases is actually a f false perception of privacy. Because these, uh, these databases are actually made by the marketers. They define the language. They define the categories. And in the worst case, when you pull yourself out, you're put into the category of people who care about their privacy. Right? So you can't really come out of this logic. Um, Sorry, guys. <laughs> it happens, all right. So um, David Phillips, on the other hand, reminds us of the fact that privacy has been actually a very contested matter. matter. If you look at feminist history, violence at home as being, you know, private being the, the you know, castle in which women are subject to violence. If you look at queer history, the heterosexual bedroom being sacred and being, you know, going public um, to question this notion of privacy has been an important part of our political activities. And actually, you do see a lot of the privacy breach examples in newspapers is actually about reinserting very conservative values about how you should consume alcohol and drugs, how you should express your sexuality, what you should say about your political opinions. So it does become actually a reinstatement of a very conservative value of what privacy actually should be. So it's not always a good thing. John McGrath, who wrote this wonderful book called Loving Big Brother, says actually a lot of our daily activities, behaviors, or what he calls it, um, performances, are actually so intertwined with digital technologies and surveillance technologies that saying that we should do without them is kind of like saying, let's go back to nature. Um, what is problematic with that, we can discuss maybe offline. <laughs> okay. Um, what's more important, and this comes back again and again to the surveillance perspective, is that surveillance is about s social sorting. That means it's about not necessarily, not necessarily identifying you, but identifying the set of groups that are going to be discriminated in a positive or negative manner. So as long as you can be identified as fitting the categories of some sort or not fitting them, you're already part. So individually going out of that is not going to work. Further, there's this idea that you as an individual are the, only, are the only one that reveals information about yourself. I'm not talking, I mean, there's of course this typical problem that you know, a lot of your friends will reveal information about yourself, but actually a lot of information does not reveal information about one person, it reveals information about many. Let me try to give that example here. So if I know by looking at a social graph, I know in this graph, Joe and Alice, are in this graph, and I know that Joe has three friends and Alice has four friends, right? And if you see the green dot with the pentagon are the two, profi two, two anonymized nodes in this graph which have three friends, and the two purple ones are the two profiles that have four friends, then I know for sure that Joe and Alice are friends. Neither Joe nor Alice has revealed this information to me. I can just infer it from the general structure. So information actually does not behave as we expect it to behave in some of our assumptions. The next problem is anonymous is vogelfrei. Vogelfrei is a German, in, I use a German word, I think there's an English equivalent as well, a concept from the medieval ages that you can sometimes lose all of your rights, especially the rights of property, um, which means you're also free to do anything you want, but in addition to that, anybody else is free to do whatever they want to you, right? So the wonderful thing about anonymity um, is that you're outside of the data protection scheme. <laughs> so that means that you cannot reclaim any data that you have left behind anonymously. Um, there were some problems with AOL search queries. People have made films out of those queries. The people would not legally necessarily be able to you know, say, this is my data, you can't do this. Because once they get into the anonymous sphere, there's no legal protection. Maybe this is wanted, huh? I'm just putting it up there. <laughs> 
Okay, um, anonymous, um, anonymizers also don't deal well with persistent com uh, communications, so if you use an anonymizer constantly and in a specific um, pattern, which most of us have a lot of patterns, then it's possible that the anonymizer guarantees do not work anymore. We saw a talk about this on Tuesday using data, mi uh, data mining on traces left anonymously, and you can actually eventually become re-identified. We don't know exactly the consequences of this on anonymizers. Um, but one, do, one does usually advise to use anonymizers sh in short periods, and one could argue that our, our identities change so fast that this is maybe not a problem, but we don't know. Okay. But basically what I would like to point out is the problem is that we constantly see privacy as an individual issue, and the solutions we give are also about protecting individuals. But maybe we should change our concepts and think about collectives. And it's actually, if you look at Tor and a lot of the anonymizers that are out there, not all of them, not the commercial ones that you know, are just a single proxy, um, it is about collectives. And maybe we need to talk about collectives instead of protecting individuals. It's a community trying to protect the community. This might also help in finding new nodes in, relay, in relays that are more trustable. Um, some people will agree that anonymizers and this whole idea of confidentiality fails. I would disagree. In a networked world, it's very important that you can sometimes detach yourself. And these technologies are very important exactly for this purpose. We need to keep them. Um, and for strategic revelation as well. I'm, I will not go in detail. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, when I criticize anonymizers, it should be understood that I want to keep them, but we just need to work on them a lot more because what is at stake is much higher and the, the threats are much higher. Okay, privacy is control. How many minutes do I have? To, do you know? 20. Oh, good. Whew. Okay, so um, privacy is control. So I already told you that it's uh, Weston's idea that you get to control your data after you reveal. Um, a lot of the solutions in this area actually has a has a is following up on a tradition uh, which is called identity management systems. The first example, I mean. If you look at it historically, identity management systems follow up on customer relationship management systems, et cetera, but I'm not going into all of that. The first example that is currently being improved with privacy in, in mind is Microsoft Passport. Uh, so the idea is that um, you would sign on with Microsoft Passport and then you could use services and Microsoft would provide all these services with information about you. Um, this was seen as a grand tragedy. Um, it was shunned, not for privacy, but, but because Microsoft was locking customers and basically evading competition. All right. Um, so the reaction to Microsoft Passport, which then failed, was Liberty Alliance, so a number of companies that has now become Oasis, said it shouldn't be just Microsoft who does this, we should all be able to do it. So we want the concept of what is called federated identity management. The model is as follows. Um, the idea is that you give the user control while getting rid of the password model. Um, you know, user wants to access a service in a relying party. This is the vocabulary that you find in these documents. It's not my vocabulary, okay? Um, so user wants to access a relying party. Relying party sends a message over the user to the identity provider. Identity provider does the authentication of the user locally and also hopefully authenticates the relying, relying party and sends the information that the relying party wants prepares it through the user, okay? And because everything goes through the user, the user has control. Okay? In Turkish, we say, if you eat it. Okay, so, all right, so um, the people notice that this might be a bit problematic if you have one identity provider, so Liberty Alliance and Oasis said, we also want a piece of the cake, we want lots of identity providers. Um, and they said, this is so good for your privacy because now you can put parts of your identity so your different data bodies can be in different identity providers. Of course, there's no such thing as collusion between identity providers and law enforcement does not have subpoenas, et cetera. But okay, this was so good for your privacy. So um, some of the people from the privacy is confidentiality paradigm said, well, you know, we, we take the critique on. We need to sometimes reveal data and we want to have kind of oversight. Um, and this identity provider thing is not bad because we have so many identities, it's so good we can outsource it. So why don't we use some of the credential, credentials we have? So the identity provider gives us the information, so I get whatever, a credential with my name, birth date, and um, my legal status. Um, and then 
Um, what I can do is I can show this to a relying party myself. I can show part of the information. I can actually use zero knowledge proofs and you know just prove whatever I have to prove and not give them the information. I might not you know I can just show that I'm above 18 without telling them my name. So what I have done is basically um, I have unlinkable identities because in every transaction I can use different parts of my transaction. These are not linkable, and I I have a system which is not forgeable. Right, so it's again these little tricks that Chaum started off with. Um, these are called anonymous transactions. I prefer to call them pseudonymous. You will see in a minute why. Um, and the very basic idea is the identity provider here can no longer profile who the user is communicating with. Does that make sense? Because as you saw here, every time the user goes to a relying party, identity provider is informed. Whereas if you have the selective disclosure credentials, the user gets a bunch of credentials and then shows them a little, little, bit, little bit by little bit every time he goes to a service provider, right? So you don't have to go back to the identi identity provider and say, I want to show a credential to somebody. You have your own autonomy a little bit, which is, you know, really nice and it's a lot of magic. Now, the problem is they want to have a universal model, right? They want this universal identity management to work in any sort of service. There are some problems with that. First of all, let's look at this concept of control. So the kind of control they're offering is very similar to real passports. So what you have is when you want to cross borders these days, I mean, it didn't always used to be that way. One country grants you, a, gives you a passport, hopefully, if everything goes well. Another country, if again, everything goes get well, will give you a visa. Then you go to the border, you show them the passport, and hopefully you can go through, right? Now, you can say you have control, but the only control you have is to make the decision, do I want to go across the border today or not, right? You can either decide not to or you have to carry this passport. That's the first thing. The second thing is you're not carrying the passport because you really want to. Somebody wants to do border control and they need somebody to carry the information. <laughs> you're actually like a mule, right, carrying this passport. So I'm not really sure this is the kind of control that I'm very excited about. So what it actually comes down to is that the amount of control I have depends on the power relationship I have with these two parties. So however much they give me control, that's the control I have. I don't have any control over the data, that's something else. The next thing is, of course, there's a power relationship between the identity provider and the relying party. It's not clear or evident that different service providers will want to outsource a lot of this information to identity providers. Some people are very interested. I mean, government is very interested. <laughs> but we'll come back to that in a second. Anyways, but in the end, identity providers and relying parties have to communicate, which means that they have to have some sort of ontology. And the thing is, who's going to decide what is relevant information and what's exactly, you know, how far do you have to go to give secure credentials, et cetera. So this becomes a power game in itself because now we get into what is identity, what counts as secure identity, and who's going to decide on that. And again, the user is not in the game here. Thanks. The other thing is now the relying party has to rely on the identity provider for making security decisions. <laughs> you can like that or not. Okay. Okay, so you want to have a universal identity system, which means that you're not going to be able to use some of the really cool technology if you have a closed circuit when somebody, for example, uses the credential twice or in an un unwanted manner. Um, so what happens now is that if the relying party has the feeling that somebody is frauding or doing something not right, um, then they want to be able to revoke your anonymity. Right? So they call this, you know, against fraud. I mean, ACTA is also against fraud, I think, right? Um, and so, that, you know, it's against fraud, so they call it the escrow key. And the idea is that, you know, every time you use these credentials, you give part of the escrow key. And if you do something fraudulent, they can walk up to the people who have the escrow key and open up and de-anonymize you. And the good candidate is, you know, governmental organizations or neutral organizations like data protection commissioners. But, I mean, are they really capable of keeping these keys? Do they have the security infrastructure for holding such a key? Who would actually be the more likely candidate to hold an escrow key? Maybe some internal national security agency? So that means that we were going to be provided with identity management with lots and lots of privacy, which can be turned off if some agency decides to. And this is called the most privacy-preserving identity management model. So yeah, on-demand anonymization. So um, 
I would argue that this is a design failure. So the problem is that you want to have a universal identity system. This is being pushed big time right now. We have millions of euros going into this in Europe, in European projects. Governments want it, insurance companies want it, the US wants it, Europe wants it, US wants to be better than Europe. Europe no, I think US doesn't have this problem. Europe wants to be better with, than US. Um, so, you know, this is a really big industry political move. And basically, because of this universal identity system, it's very easy to construct fraud use cases. And once you construct the fraud use cases, you have an argument for key escrow, right? So it's actually like an argument that produces key escrow. Um, it's really weird. All these really good privacy people are all working on key escrow. I mean, it's really wild. Okay, so, um, and it dismisses existing solutions. So all the stuff with double spending prevention, blacklisting, without the anonymization, reputation systems, which work with closed systems, are dismissed because you want a universal system. Okay, so basically what is it? We introduce a surveillance system. We call it doing privacy, and we say trust us. Okay, so we put a privacy label on a surveillance system. This is a danger, right? I'm not saying this is definitely happening. This is in the research plans, right? Let's see if they even succeed with identity management. But something is going on here. So what could be done? Well, do we really need three parties? Maybe we can just do with two. It's enough to have one power relationship than two. Um, or we can put the relying party and the identity provider together. Um, another option is maybe ask other users to help us in identifying ourselves. We really need all these organizations that are going to tell what we are. Um, and I think one of the main problems again and again, if you remember in the anonymizers, there was this idea that the individual is responsible for taking care of the privacy. Well, here we have in the documents, if you look at these documents, you have this user who's going to control her data from morning till evening. Right, you're going to audit the companies who collect your data. You're going to decide who's going to get which data. You're going to write policies. You're going to see if they did something wrong. You're going to make complaints. And how many times do you, I don't know if any of you um, use things with privacy settings, but how many times do you go to your privacy settings? Now you have to also do all the auditing. You know, it's, a, it's a super user they're imagining. Um, and this, this is a citizen as well that they're imagining. It's a customer that they're imagining. You, know, you have all these roles that are being put onto the individual. Um, and they have to be the controller as well. They have to make sure everything with data protection is going well, make sure that the transparency system is working. Basically, the user is responsible. <laughs> okay, so this is the model they're creating. This is what it means to control. Okay, last paradigm. I don't have nice pictures because it was like this morning at seven when I did the slides. And anyway, so, um, <laughs> so the idea, <laughs> The idea is basically, you know, a lot of the privacy stuff, I'm sure you've heard of the argument, you know, you value the stuff you get back for your data more than your privacy. So there's this kind of utility function. What do you get out of giving your data? Um, you know, some people say, you know, it's not like when we make these decisions, we're only making decisions for, on economic value. They're actually social influences as well. I'm sure a lot of people in this community um, have learned from each other what to do with their data, and that we do on a global scale, right? So we have what we call privacy practices, and there's a lot of people from human-computer interaction and privacy design um, saying, let's make data practices transparent. Let's, let's show each other how we deal with data, and let's hope that through that we can cause more transparency and see what, what's happening in the current practices and start making claims about how we should collectively change the current practices, right? Sounds like a lot of blah, 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 but it's kind of nice, okay? I think it's nice, okay, whatever. <laughs> okay, so um, the idea is allow users to individually and collectively affect the flows of information. The examples that are given are identity mirror or privacy mirror, so you see how your identity is represented online. If you, for example, do a Google search of yourself, you can see what kind of information is scattered. That is information that goes into your privacy practice, right? Um, so. Most importantly, individual transparency is not enough. People are now trying to reduce transparency into knowing what you have given a company. If you go to Google Dashboard, you will find all of your data. How exciting. <laughs> I, mean, like, I want to know what they do with this data. I want to know what kind of categories I'm part of. You know? I want to know what other information they have about other people, and maybe I want to use that data as well, right? No, what do you find? You find all, everything you have given them in a limited version, of course, but okay. All right, so we need to question this economic thinking. It's not about individual decisions and utility. There's something more. 
But what can we actually question about these very nice people who are proposing privacy as practice? Um, users may want to be open to negotiation. We might kind of, you know, collectively introduce very nice practices. But how about service providers and governments? Do they really want to negotiate what our privacy is with us? Um, and who defines what it means to be transparent? Transparency is mostly defined by the people in power, and they decide what it means to be transparent. Um, and which practices will prevail? I mean, wisdom of the crowds, but which wisdom will we, will we get if we develop privacy practices based on majority opinion of what privacy should be? Okay, lessons learned, and then I'm going to stop. So, my recommendations are we should avoid monopolizing what privacy technically is. You know, some people will say it's confidentiality. If you give your data, you're done. And I think this is too limited. I think we should try to keep different translations open and look for different creative uh, designs that might surprise us in many ways, right? Um, privacy is being actively subverted, right? So per data protection tells us that our data is a personal property. Um, if you're coming from a free software background, I think you don't want to go into this data is property relationship. I mean, I hope you question that. Um, privacy is being turned into a product, so you can pay and get it. And most importantly, with the stuff I showed you with identity management, privacy is becoming a way of putting a little nice thing on surveillance systems. So, you know, the, the naked the sc body scanner in airports, you know, we don't show your genitalia. Whoa, 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 it's privacy preserving, don't you love it? You know, like, um, we've got this labeling thing going on. Um, I would really recommend everybody in this room, but also researchers, to follow privacy technologies closely. The constraints are greater, they need to be really robust given some of the results from anonymization, and we need to evaluate their impact. So how are they being used? How are they actually not being used? How, how are they really functioning? It's very important to tell stories. I think we need a lot of anecdotes about what happens with the technology we produce. And some people claim privacy is dead. I'd say it's not dead. We're in the process of creating it and negotiating it, and to do that, we need to do it collectively. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we have just a couple minutes for uh, a quick couple questions. And it looks like we have some from the outside world, IRC. Yeah, so we do have two questions from the IRC. The first one is, does speaker think that the recent FTC report on privacy will make a difference for is redefines personal data as consumer data that can be reasonably linked to a specific kinds of Consumer, computer, or other devices? Oh, I lost the question halfway. Can you repeat it, please? Sorry. Okay, I will repeat. Does speaker think that the recent FTC report on privacy will make a difference for this redefines personal data else? Consumer data that can be reasonably linked to the specific as consumer, computer, or other device? Okay, so the person is asking if the definition of personal data and the cautions given in the FTC report on privacy is going to make a difference. Yes. I, I'm not totally sure. I, I know that they gave, they, they're ve what is really nice about the FTC report is that they're actually taking some technological results into consideration because most of these policy documents and data protection say they want to be technology neutral, which is a really weird concept. Um, and what's nice in the FTC report is, you know, recognizing that researchers from technology have found some results and they're integrating that into policy. Um, what they're not doing, for example, is really looking at some of the credential stuff or, you know, ways of doing technology and integrating that. So I'm really glad that the FTC report has taken a step away from technology neutrality, um, but at the same time, I think it's not enough. I hope that helps as an answer. Thank you. And the other question is about the video, the anonymous city. Is it public available and where can we download it? Um, the video is not publicly available, but um, I mean, there are a couple of reasons I can be very open about it. Um, a, there are some mistakes. We didn't mention Mr. Chaum. Um, <laughs> and that was because I'm coming from the German tradition. Um, and I was very much um, in contact with Andreas Fitzmann, who actually told me, told me the story. Um, there are some mistakes in the models, and also there's the problem that the videos sometimes get interpreted as um, possibly criticizing 
anonymizers in a way like Eric Schmidt, like get rid of them. Um, and that's not the point of the video, but there's a sequel that's coming up with the anonymous city and transparent city and the bridge connecting them. So wait up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding the technology of Microsoft and Stefan Brandt. Yeah. It's also used in their uh, product. What do you think? Uh, it's, it's also used in the Neue Personalausweis, the German uh, system. Uh, can, do you have any comments on that? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I know that Microsoft is, uh, has been with Cardspace for a long time, and they've been following this whole identity management matter. Um, I think anything that has a key escrow is not going to work for me, so I'm just kind of taking a bit of a distance. But I don't know the details. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I think it's great that science is proceeding in the field of anonymity, but um, what's your take on the legal situation? Don't you think that at least for the mainstream of uh, law obeying uh, uh, consumers or internet surfers, yeah. for example, in Germany, um, they won't be allowed to use anonymizing software in, at some point of time? Well, the nice thing is that, I shouldn't say this loudly, but you know, just <laughs> um, a lot of people are mixing the fact that anonymization fails with anonymizers fail and we hope that this continues because that way they won't do any sort of legal um, decision making about anonymizers. Um, somebody just needs to talk to Eric Schmidt and make him stop talking about illegalizing anonymizers and then maybe people will forget about them. That's kind of our hope. <laughs> so I think we have time for one last question. If there is one. Uh, yeah, hello. I have to get back to the movie a little bit because um, it made a lot of fun of, of those anonymizers, but um, it put them in a, quite a different context. Is there a chance that at least some of these techniques are a little bit less ridiculous when we see them yeah, actually in communication context, packet switching context, and so on? Mm. And second question, is there any chance that there might be something that is not actually shown in this movie, but might be another technique that helps? Yeah, I mean, we're really aware that there is a possibility that the film is taken as a ridiculous um, interpretation, but it's actually kind of having fun while we're making these technologies. Um, and I think, I, mean, I hope it's fun to watch. I mean, like, it's, it kind of makes anonymity a fun thing, and I'm actually also developing a game right now so that people in a room can play anonymizers. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's really funny, like people go crazy. Um, anyways, but um, I completely understand that there could be this possible take that it's ridiculizing anonymity, and anonymity is actually a very elegant, uh, anonymizers are very elegant solutions um, on some level, right? I mean, they're very simple, but very elegant on some level. And we're trying to sh bring that to the force as well. Um, your second question, you have to remind me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, just your, your opinion on the future development of anonymizers, if there is any de development, that there might be a technique we haven't yet uh, found out. I think... And which works. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what the guys did on Tuesday, Lexi and his colleague, on how you use data minimization to kind of understand, you know, who's actually behind an anonymizer, I think there's going to be some counter technologies to that. That's pretty simple to do. Um, and I know that there's a paper from... Stanford about how you can hack data mining and um, the whole classification algorithms that they were using. So you can actually, you know, profile the algorithms that are being used and then start hacking them. So I think we're going to see literally a war on like hacking data data mining, and that's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Let's give Seda another round of applause.